so this is a pre-recorded video lecture unfortunately I wasn't able to make it to class today um, hopefully the truancy department doesn't get after me um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, photogrammetry I actually don't know how to pronounce it but uh, but we're gonna we're gonna do this um, photogrammetry is basically uh, getting measurements from pictures uh, getting meaningful data um, and so what we're what we're just trying to do is is take a picture of something or several pictures and reconstruct an actual object based on those pictures. Uh, the technique I'm going to show you today is a little more hands-on, uh, but it produces uh, pretty good results actually. Um, and so uh, let's first go over you know the two main types of photogrammetry. Uh, there's 3D, which is this image you're seeing down here. Um, of actually taking a picture of something at a bunch of different angles and then asking the computer to figure out where you took those pictures physically. Um, this is pretty difficult to use in my experience. I don't know if it's gotten better over the years. Um, so I've had a lot of trouble getting good results. Um, I know you can get great results when you do um, terrain mapping or something like that with a drone or from an airplane and you can actually stitch together a pretty reasonable image. Uh, but as far as uh, fine detail on like statues or whatever, I've still yet to master the art of that. Um, the other type of, of, of photogrammetry is uh, 2D, which is something I think I came up with uh, kind of on my own. Uh, it, it apparently exists out there when you do some Googling, um, YouTubing, when you YouTube it, 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 it exists. Um, but this is a process I actually developed for my work here at the National Lab uh, to 3D model uh, difficult to measure things um, and the purpose of this mainly is like if I want to stick a label on a specific piece of equipment that I don't have a CAD drawing for I can take a picture of it and then I can um, uh, on, on this part I can basically make a 3D part out of that and then make a custom label or custom shape whatever I need to do um, to put text on there or uh, or reproduce something actually. Um, so this is a process I found to be pretty robust, very reliable, and it relies solely on you, the user, to, uh, to develop these things. Um, it's like 90 degrees in here, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, there's, like I said, a few use cases for it. Um, one of my favorite use cases is actually um, if you're really struggling to get into CAD software or CAD design and you, you're like an artist or you you just have a concept that you want to get out there then you can sketch something um, and turn your sketch into a 3d print and that's a pretty uh, low bar for entry uh, for 3d printing so if you have like a proof of concept or something a little more organic that's that's pretty hard to model in, in the 3d space um, then you can take a drawing that you make um, an orthographic drawing just top down um, and you can turn that into, uh, into a 3D part, and th th that's where this technique has a lot of power. Um, this also works great for uh, measuring like radii, radiuses, um, for actually determining what a radius is, because unless you have a set of radius gauge blocks um, or radius measurement tools, uh, then it's impossible to tell with just a, a set of calipers. Um, so rely you can get pretty good results uh, for radiuses based on that. Um, another reason you'd want to use this is if you don't have an original part. Uh, if you guys have seen Mythbusters, there's um, Adam and Jamie often will look at movie scenes to uh, recreate a prop or a jig or something that they've seen based solely on photographs. Their process is a little more organic. They use um, they use kind of rules of thumb and like, oh, this guy's you know five foot six foot tall, therefore this cage you know is is eight foot tall. Uh, there was some scene with a with a shark cage from Jaws they were trying to reproduce. Anyway, so that's that's another reason to be to be using photogrammetry. Um, let me just make sure I'm still recording. Indeed, I am. All right. Um, some prerequisites. Uh, hopefully, you guys have these slides, um, and you can click the links here. Um, everything that I require uh, from the software side is free, open source, except for Tinkercad. I think that's that's what we're still using for this class. Um, but Tinkercad, uh, it, it works. It's the easiest CAD that I've ever had to use, but it's also very difficult um, having come from a SolidWorks background. Um, so you'll need a camera. I prefer smartphone cameras just because 
Um, you can really go over the top with a, a dedicated digital camera, um, but it it's it's um, it, it introduces a lot of data that you have to then uh, process and filter out that you're going to get rid of anyway. Um, webcams also will work, um, but you're going to have a little bit harder time just getting everything positioned. Um, there's an exercise at the end of this um, uh, where I'm going to have you guys do your own object um, and recreate it in 3D. Um, and so, you know, uh, if you have a cell phone camera, it's going to work out a little bit better. If you don't, I've included some images of some bonus, um, bonus objects at the end of this uh, for you guys to take and actually model yourself. Um, you also need some paper. This is like standard white printer paper. Um, the reason for this is you want a nice contrasty background to whatever object that you're photographing. Um, we use GIMP. Uh, GIMP is for um, image manipulation, GNU image manipulation program. Um, and that is basically a free open source alternative to Photoshop. And we'll actually use GIMP to do a lot of the groundwork before we actually transition um, our part into the 3D space. And a lot of what you're going to do, uh, a lot of what you're going to need to do is just basic, tidy cleanup work. Um, and that's going to really that's going to really help uh, improve your results by the end of it. And it's way easier to manipulate pixels than it is to manipulate um, uh, spline paths, as it as you'll be doing in Inkscape. Well, hopefully you won't have to. Uh, the next program is Inkscape. Um, it's free, open source again, um, and that is a vector image um, program, similar to I think Adobe Illustrator. Um, and basically what that does is it converts a series of pixels in a grid to splines and curves and shapes. And so what that means is you can effectively um, take an image, convert it into a vector, and then scale it up as large or as small, uh, scale it down to as small as you want it. Um, and because the uh, image is now turned into a series of shapes, um, it effectively has infinite resolution. So you could turn, you know, uh, a drawing into something that goes on a billboard. Um, and this is useful to us because um, Tinkercad actually accepts uh, scalable vector graphics, SVGs, exported from Inkscape. And that's kind of our intermediate step. Uh, but it affords us a lot of, a lot of room to work um, and really clean up uh, junk um, that may have come over from GIMP. Uh, but I'm going to try my best in today's demo to, uh, to not have that. Um, next thing you're going to need is Tinkercad, kind of talked about that. Um, and then I want you guys to find an object around your house, um, you know, scissors, keys, bottles, mugs, something like a unique shape that you're not just going to be able to hit with calipers, you know. Um, it, you can challenge yourself as much or as little as you want. Um, I found that, again, this method really only works for two and a half dimensional shapes. And what I mean by that is, um, say this this coffee cup is sort of a two and a half dimensional shape, in that um, you start out with a it's got water in it. You start out with a uh, a circle, and then you can extrude it out. But obviously, this has a slope to it, so it's not really a two and a half dimensional shape. Um, let's see, cell phone again, much closer to a two and a half dimensional shape because if you were to take a picture of it from the top down, then you would get a square and then that square could be extruded out uh, into the rectangle that is your phone. And so if you wanted to like make a phone case or something uh, and figure out like, you know, what these radii are in the, in the corners here. It seems to have dropped something. Oh. Um, if you want to figure out what these radii are here in the corners, um, you can uh, 3D print uh, your phone and then you can uh, design a phone case around the dimensions that you got off of your, your photogrammetry. Um, okay, I think we're ready to start getting into our process here, the demo. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll just cover this real quick. Basically what you do is you take a picture, you clean it up in GIMP, you import it into Inkscape and convert it to a vector, um, and then you uh, scale that vector to some known dimensions that you can uh, pull off of that. And that should essentially give you a one-to-one -one scale model of what you're trying to photograph, uh, yeah, what you're trying to photograph. Um, here's an example of good and bad photographs. Uh, the photograph on the left is uh, obviously a very good image, very high contrast, um, very easily distinguishable tool, 
Uh, minimal shadows, those can be cleaned up later in uh, post-processing. So their shadows aren't too big of a deal, but you definitely want to watch out for them because if you're lazy, it'll, uh, it, it'll add extra material here where the shadow is instead of uh, just ha reproducing the handle of this tool. Uh, the bad image, of course, uh, you don't have a contrasty background. Um, the image is not at a perfect 90-degree uh, angle to the plane. It's stacked up on some cables, and the process is going to catch these cables. But sometimes this is what you have to deal with. Um, and if you get really good at GIMP, you can actually um, you can translate, and you can scale, and you can do perspective warping on this image, um, and basically manually edit out everything um, to make it work. But this this is not a part uh, a position you want to be in, especially for uh, the first time around on this. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and start the demo here. Um, I'm gonna move to my screen cap. Woo! Um, let's see. We're gonna go to our file manager. Nope. We're gonna go to. We're gonna open up um, GIMP. Actually, I'm gonna close out of that because this was a test demo. Uh, we're gonna open up GIMP on here. Um, that's going to uh, pop up this window and. On Linux, it's a little bit different. I think um, if these windows don't pop up on either side, then what you're going to want to do is go to Windows, and I think it's like uh, recently closed dialog boxes, somewhere in here where you can pop up the, the tool selection. That'll help. Um, that'll help the process a little bit better. Uh, so anyway, you're going to want to hit File, Open, and then go to your image. And I'll use the pair of pliers because that actually produces a pretty cool result. Uh, we'll go ahead and convert it. It really doesn't matter uh, what we're doing here. Now, what we want to do is convert this into a just plain Jane black and white image where black is the tool, white is the background, um, and that makes uh, turning this into a vector a lot easier in Inkscape. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Colors, um, Saturation, and we are going to turn saturation all the way down and just turn this straight black and white. Um, and then we're going to hit colors again. We're going to go down to threshold. And this is actually going to say any value below this value, any pixel value below this value is going to be white and any above is going to be black. Um, and so we can play with these sliders. You can see the shadow here. Uh, I can't zoom in from here. You can see the shadow. It, it gets more pronounced when I slide it one way and it goes away when I slide it the other. Uh, but the trade-off here is that text on there, China, is going to show up as, as background or not an object. Uh, so we need to clean this up some more. So we're going to keep sliding this. Uh, not, not that far. We're, I think about here is reasonable. And then what we'd, we're going to do is hit OK, and that converts this whole image into just black or white. Then we're going to go in and we're going to select the, uh, I think it's the paintbrush tool. And we can do uh, different brush styles and sizes. Mainly, I just want a super hard brush because when we go in here, um, I want to just take this middle parts, these middle white pixels, and convert them into to black pixels where I know the the model is. Um, and you know, try your best. It's it's not going to be perfect all the time um, for cleaning up, uh, but it, it's going to help again create this vector. So I'm going to just tidy this up a little bit. Um, nothing. OK, tilde apparently does that. <laughs> um, I'm going to clean up a lot of these specks and dots because it's going to Inkscape is going to freak out when it sees a white space that's inside of your object. It's not going to freak out too bad, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely advantageous to you to uh, make sure you take care of all of the uh, white pixels um, in here. And so we'll go ahead and turn up the size a bit so we can get this whole handle. And see, I added material to the handle there, but Control Z will uh, let you just go ahead and undo that happy little accident we just had there. Um, let's zoom in some more. Turn down our size. And we're going to go in and clean up this. Again, this isn't, you know, this this step that you you guys will be doing is going to save you a lot of, of heartache uh, later on down the road. So this is the easiest way, this is the easiest place to fix 
any problems that might come up is to actually just go in and take care of all these speckles. Uh, let's see here. Let's get the needle nose. Oop. And clean up the, any reflections that the metal might have done. Come on. Do, 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 do. And some, some things may be easier to fix in Inkscape. Um, I'll try to go over that, uh, but again, the goal is to get a pretty perfect model, uh, a pretty perfect black and white outline um, into Inkscape. That's, like I say, it's gonna make your life a lot easier, and it's really gonna, really gonna help, um, because manipulating pixels is a lot easier than manipulating uh, vectors. Um, I'm doing this with a mouse, so you have to forgive me. I don't have one of those Wacom tablets or whatever, whatever people use. Dang it! Do 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 do. do. So that. Go ahead and scroll over here. Get the tips of the pliers. This is uh, exercise and frustration. Doesn't have to be perfect, but again, the more perfect you get it, the easier your life is going to be uh, down the road here. Um, so that's just me doing my due diligence. OK, let's uh, go ahead and shrink this down some more. And you know, you can be as, as thorough or as not thorough as you want to be, but again, it'll bite you later on. If you're not careful. All right, so let me go ahead and zoom out here. Uh, uh, image, sorry, uh, view, zoom. Yeah, should be minus, but it doesn't like that. Um, okay, so now we have a perfect silhouette of the thing that we photographed. Um, and if you want, like, if you're if you're trying to be uh, a little more artistic uh, with things, you're not you're not super concerned about this transition here, then you can go ahead and, and clean that up in GIMP and make that a smoother transition, and that'll make for a, a prettier model. Uh, but what we're going to do now is we are going to hit File and then say Export As, and we'll keep it as a JPEG. That's fine. Uh, we'll put this on my desktop, and we'll just go ahead and call this uh, Meaningful Name. No, we'll call it uh, Black and White export and uh, we can go ahead and just do 100% quality uh, really whatever you want to do we don't need to save any of this exif data but it, it has no effect on on uh, the output so we go ahead and export it and boom it's exported to my desktop so now we're going to go into Inkscape and I'll just go ahead and close this out and fire it up again um, Inkscape We'll fire this up again, and depending on how big your model is, um, is you're going to need to change your document properties if you need to model something that's much larger. Um, but if we go ahead, I mean, by default it's A4, which is pretty dang close to 8.5 by 11. Um, and so it's basically modeled after a sheet of paper. Um, and so, so if you need anything larger than that, you can go ahead and change your document properties. All right, so from there, we're going to hit File, Import, and then we are going to go to our desktop, and we are going to select our black and white .jpg. Uh, keep the defaults, image DPI from file, image resolute rendering. Um, it doesn't really matter, auto. Go ahead and hit OK, and it will bring in a picture, the uh, picture of your tool. Now. An important thing to keep note of, especially if you want a two-scale drawing, one-to-one, uh, -one, or really any just proportional uh, model, is to click on this little paddle lock up here. Uh, it says, when locked, change both width and height by the same proportion. So we're going to click that because now our whole, model, or our whole photo is scaled um, equally uh, when we scale it. All right. Uh, next step is to create a shape of a known dimension and so what I'm gonna do is I am going to first zoom in because you guys probably can hardly see that 
I'm going to zoom in here and I'm going to say, you know, I, I can easily get, um, easily get this dimension right here. We'll go ahead and just call that like the width of the, the pliers or the width of the handle on one side of the pliers. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little square to draw a rectangle and I'm just going to draw a basic rectangle. Hey, look at that. And I always, I click this mouse button here because that just lets me move it around and, and play with it. Um, now for reference, we can go ahead and click on fill and stroke, which is, I have a toolbar already mapped here, but if you go to, I think it's under object, fill and stroke, you can actually change the outline of the object, which is a stroke paint, to uh, whatever color you want. And for this demo, I'll be using red because uh, it's a little, little more contrasty. Uh, and so what I'm looking to do is get the size of this image to match up to the size of these pliers. And that's why we pick a dimension. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my calipers here. And we are going to do a quick measurement on the, the width of this handle here. Um, and I'm getting uh, 0.37 inches. Um, and if you're, a th you know, if you're going to sit and think about this all day, it's probably 0.375. Uh, but what's 0 .05 inches among friends? Um, so I'm going to make the height of this square to be uh, 0.37 inches tall. And if when you download Inkscape, it's automatically in millimeters. You can do it in millimeters if you want. I just prefer American units. Uh, so we'll go ahead and change this height to 0.37 and then hit enter and boom, it has scaled up the square. Um, and so all we care about, we don't care about the length of the square, all we need is these two uh, sides right here, the top and the bottom, to match up with the top and the bottom of our tool here. Um, and so, again, a lot of this is art, uh, but there's still, we're trying to get some more science into it. Um, so we're going to go ahead and scale up this image until we feel it uh, meets the criteria of this square. Um, and as you can see, we're pretty dang close um, as far as matching up the scale of our image to the 0.37 uh, height of this square. Okay, so now that we've done that, we can go ahead and delete this square. So you select it and then hit delete. We can zoom out using shift and the minus sign. Um, and we have a picture of our pliers here. Cool, great. Uh, what we're going to want to do now is take this image that we have and convert it into a scalable vector graphic, SVG. And what we do is we click on Path and then Trace Bitmap. That'll bring up a little window here. I'm going to try to resize this so you guys can see. And of course, this is... There we go. Um, we, can do some, we can do a live preview, um, and that'll help us kind of determine... Um, uh, what this is going to get converted into later. Now, um, it's important to note that if you didn't do a black and white image, uh, this threshold thing will matter if you're going to do like a brightness cutoff thing. Uh, but since we have just black and just white, then we then th this really doesn't matter. And again, this is the whole point of GIMP is going to be your friend because it's going to be easiest to manipulate your image uh, in GIMP. So we're going to go ahead and hit OK that is going to generate a vector directly behind our image. And the way to tell the vector from the image is just to uh, look at the uh, edge of your document. And the vector is not going to have a white background. So we go ahead and we can click on the white background and hit delete. And then we are left with pliers. And as you can see, there's no white background that's interfering with the edge of our document. So that's how you know you've, you've, you've got, got the real deal. Now, I kind of like this spring deal. It's going to show up as, um, as, as a pretty cool artifact uh, when we import it. Uh, but you know, here's where you can, you can do some cleanup of, of your, um, your vector. And to do that, you can click Edit Path by Nodes, and you can see every single node on here where it tried to draw a new line. Um, and we can say, well, I don't like, I don't like these, these nodes here. So you can delete them. We can actually get rid of some of these um, these white spaces here uh, in the spring of the handle and like oh hey I don't like how I don't like how this is, is jogging around so you can actually click and you can move these things around and change their endpoints um, 
and and really just get into the nitty gritty of of how this thing is is built. Um, and this is going to help when you want to clean up your 3D print, um, or when you want to optimize for 3D printing. Um, and so you know we kind of cleaned up that little cavity there. We'll go ahead and clean up this white space here. We have an extra piece of material here. We'll go ahead and get rid of, um, and then it'll draw. If it's blank, it'll draw a line all the way down to the bottom left corner. Um, and so that's that's just another method of cleaning up, but it is definitely a lot a lot more cumbersome than just going in and GIMP and and doing your doing the due diligence and doing putting in the right time. Uh, so while we're here, I'm just going to clean up you know these extra facets here that are just getting in the way um, that are going to it's going to show up on the print um, as its own thing, and that's not necessarily what you want. Um, hello, what do we have here? Okay, that's an artifact. Sometimes you get artifacts in Inkscape, and you have to zoom in or out, and that will force the image to be refreshed. Um, for this stuff here, what I can do actually is just select um, select all these points uh, in the middle here that are just giving us guff, and it will interpolate in between them best it can. And so um, that's what we're going to do. See, we just cleaned up that whole edge. Um, and simplified it into a into a straight line, um, and we can do that with the top here. We can say, you know what, this is supposed to be a straight line. We'll just get rid of all the points in between that are messing up our straight line, um, and delete hue and delete hue, and really just clean up this this tool um, here. So now we have a significantly simplified um, drawing and. What you want to do before you export this is to just double check and make sure there's no extra points. Now by clicking on this, it put a bounding box around the bottom here, so I'm wondering if there's any extra um, things in here that, uh, that might show up. It doesn't appear to be the case, so what we're going to do next, now that we have our artwork um, drawn, and if you're, if you're good with, with computer drawing or or you have a Wacom tablet or whatever, you can actually sketch stuff in Inkscape. And it's a pretty valuable um, program to, to learn from because um, it is um, it's quite useful. Um, and you can come directly from here into a 3D model um, from your drawings. And so, again, if you're, you know, if you're a, p a pen and paper kind of person, then great, you know, do the, do the whole process. But if you're kind of having trouble breaking into that 3D space, Inkscape is a another great place to start. Um, okay, anyway, so from here we're going to hit File, uh, Save As, and I already have drawing saved, so I'm just going to call it uh, Pliers uh, .svg. We're going to hit Save, and it has saved it as an SVG. Okay, let me make sure we're still recording here. Um, cool. Um, we have pliers.svg saved, so now we're going to go into Tinkercad, and I assume you guys have already logged in and played around here a little bit. Um, here is my last attempt at these before I did any cleanup, um, so I'm just going to actually delete this. Um, last year's class, I had them redo uh, bottle opener, and so this was actually a, a model that I um, actually just broke, and then we took it into Inkscape and actually repaired it in Inkscape. Um, and that's another use uh, for this stuff is if you have something that's broken and you want to fix it then you can you can do this and you can make a beautiful uh, bottle opener or whatever you want um, again that's just just another cool cool thing about photogrammetry so when you're in Tinkercad we're gonna hit create new design and it is going to pop us into the Tinkercad workspace uh, right-clicking lets you move the model around uh, right now we don't have a model in here so what we're going to do is we are going to um, click import and then it supports STLs, OBJs, and SVGs. As I recall um, STLs and OBJs are three-dimensional file formats but an SVG is just a two-dimensional um, graphic format and that's that's where this trick works is because we can import an SVG. So we'll go ahead uh, hit uh, I think open or something, choose a file, uh, click on pliers.svg, 
keep everything on here. We'll center it on the artboard because that, that'll be zero, zero. Um, and then make sure your scale's at 100%, and then we can go ahead and import. Now, it's going to take a minute to import pliers because it's, um, it's a lot of, of splines and stuff. But as you can see, we have now made a 3D object from a 2D object um, using only uh, photographs. And so you can 3D print this direct out if you want, or if you don't, or, or if you're not happy with, with how Tinkercad sets this up, you can click on the model and then you can resize it to be, you know, a three millimeter tall pair of pliers. Or if you want, they can be 30 millimeters tall. I mean, do what you want, but then you can do other things to these, like um, you can do a, uh, we can cut holes out of it. And is that how that works? Um, you should be able to cut holes. Yeah. Should be able to cut holes in your models um, using this method. Um, but let me uh, let me just change some dimensions here. Let me make this smaller. And we'll go ahead um, and and you can export it from here with holes or whatever other stuff you want to do to this object. Um, again, I don't really like Tinkercad because you can't do much like as far as filleting or chamfering edges or anything like that. Um, that's where I get a little frustrated with this. Um, but you can you can put cavities and stuff in here um, as you want. Oh, that's a hole. There we go. You can do negative shapes, which is pretty cool. Uh, anywho, uh, we're going to click export and then we can export it as an STL. And boom, Fantabulous Alice, Alis, um, is our file name, I guess. And now we can 3D print this directly on a 3D printer. Um, I don't have any software on here that will render this, so there's no point in opening it. Um, but you can, you know, modify these these 3D models as you see fit. And what's important, um, you're not. What's important to realize is you're not limited to paper. You can. Um, you can basically like take a picture of a house, take a picture of, of a wall in a room that's really cool, and you can actually make artwork directly from that. Um, and that's really the big thing is, is, um, is as long as you've got good photographs and you're prepared to put in the footwork to actually mask out the object in your image, then you can get fully reproducible 3D models. Um, let me go back to my presentation here because I have a couple other um, couple other slides before I let you guys go. I think we can get out of here a little early. Um, so here's some cleanup and GIMP steps. Again, uh, these are useful for uh, if you don't want to scrub through the whole video, you can uh, you can go through these slides and there'll be a bit of a spark notes to this presentation. Uh, importing into Inkscape. Uh, again, we've been over that. Uh, Tinkercad import. You can. Yeah, covered all that. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please get a hold of Jacob Yoder. Uh, he can get a hold of me. Uh, I think I'm going to be uploading this onto YouTube, so um, I'm not going to be putting my personal email or anything on there. Um, but I will be listed as a teacher or something um, for your class, and you should be able to get a hold of me then. Uh, again, I'll be down uh, on work travel, so um, if you have any questions, just feel free to email them to me, and I'll get to them. Uh, after close of business um, any any night this week. Um, homework, of course. Of course you're gonna have homework. It's an online class. Um, pick something in your house to try this with or pick your house. I don't really it doesn't really matter. Like you're kinda limited by, you know, your your phot photographer's eye um, and I guess how big a sheet of white paper you can get. Um, but I have some uh, bonus images as I said at the beginning in here. If you guys don't, um, if you don't have a, a camera or a cell phone camera, um, I, it can make your life a little easier. But this is definitely a technique that has certainly helped me out um, in, here at the lab, um, and really helped me turn uh, useful 3D models very quickly. Um, and so I think this is this is a useful skill, especially uh, now that we have a world where everybody gets a 3D printer. Uh, this is a wooden spoon uh, I got from our kitchen. I need to return that. Um, here's a pair of scissors. See if you can make a model with scissors that move. 
Um, again, the reason I like the scissors is because you are going to have a really hard time modeling this shape in Tinkercad um, all by yourself. And this this cut out here and this nub right here. I mean, this these things would be very difficult to do uh, even in SolidWorks, let alone Tinkercad. Uh, and I've been using SolidWorks for um, for holy cow, almost a decade now. I'm getting old. Wow. Um, anyway, yeah, you can take your pictures uh, of the objects. I'm really interested to see what they are. Um, so please, um, at the next class or, or after this break, uh, go ahead and, and uh, show us what you got. I'd really like to see it. Uh, I, also on the slides, I have some bonus material here, uh, just a little bit more on photogrammetry if you're, uh, you're into that, um, and then some Inkscape and GIMP tutorials. Uh, YouTube is a great place to, uh, to get started um, learning these things. Um, I, it's a little slow. Uh, to, don't be frustrated with yourself, especially with Inkscape. It took me about uh, three to six months to really get proficient at it. So just take it easy and, um, and, and go one step at a time. Same with GIMP. I mean, it's its, its own thing. Well, anyway, guys, uh, that, I think, is the end of my lecture. Um, it is. Yeah. That is the end of my lecture, so I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go for the rest of the day, and we can um, uh, reconvene after this, shoot me any questions you have, uh, and I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Bye.